Now, let us begin uh, our last session for the day. My name is Choi Ji, the MC for this session. Now, let me invite the Director General Ko Kyung Seok and ask for the opening remarks. Let's give him a big round of applause. His Excellency, I know Hibogo Yejen, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Denmark to the Republic of Korea. Mr. Chair, distinguished speakers, Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, I am very delighted to open the Korea-EU Roundtable on the Middle Eastern and North African affairs today. The Republic of Korea and the European Union have co-hosted the annual international conference on the MANA affairs since 2015. We had to postpone last year's regular conference due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. This year, we are hosting a roundtable instead as one of the sessions in Jeju Forum, which I believe, albeit smaller in size, will be a meaningful occasion to continue our lively exchanges of ideas until conditions for a full-fledged conference are met hopefully next year. I thank the Jeju Forum Secretariat for providing such a wonderful venue and full support. The topic of today's roundtable is changing political dynamics in the Middle East. The politics in the region have been ever shifting, but recent developments are noteworthy as they bring changes to the underlying structures of regional dynamics. The new developments, a series of Israel-Arab normalization agreements, integration of the new US administration, ongoing negotiations for restoring of the JCPOA, and the recent confrontation between Israel and Palestine are deeply intertwined, adding to the complexity of the region's political dynamics. Yet, however challengeable the task is, it is our shared responsibility to seek ways to secure peace in the region. And by our responsibility, I mean all of us, the MENA countries, Korea, the European Union, and the international community as a whole, because to rephrase what Dr. Martin Luther King once said, insecurity anywhere is a threat to security everywhere. More than ever, we need concerted international efforts and wisdom to prevent further conflicts and bring sustainable peace and prosperity to this region. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the Republic of Korea has long fostered solid economic ties with the MENA countries. Our areas of engagement are now expanding into global issues, including public health. Our humanitarian assistance to the region is ever increasing. For example, the, since the COVID-19 pandemic, Korea has provided to the region more than $300 million of disease control commodities. We also shared our good practices in disease prevention, such as drive-through testing sites, use of mobile applications, and remote learning. This year, Korea pledged about $80 million of humanitarian assistance for Syrian refugees and $21 million for Yemen and Palestine. As Korea, Koreans understand the tragedy of, of war themselves, we sincerely hope for peaceful solutions of conflicts in the MENA region. And we would like to play a contributing role, especially in cooperation with the Euro our European partners. The European Union has long supported stabilizing efforts in the MENA region. We particularly appreciate the EU's mediating role in the talks in Vienna for restoring the nuclear talk and in the Middle East quartet, as well as for other issues. Korea, to support the EU's efforts for successful restoration of the, of the JCPOA, and it has maintained a close consultation with the EU and European countries to this end. Two weeks ago in London, President Moon Jae-in also stressed that the EU is our strategic partner with whom we have shared, uh, promote common interests and shared universal values of uh, uh, humanity. 
we wish it to continue conversations with our European friends for enhancing cooperation on MANA affairs based on our shared values and interests. Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, I hope that today's roundtable is a timely event to share our views on the recent developments in MANA and jointly seek possible ways forward. I look for the fruitful discussion of the ideas and views. Thank you. Your passionate remarks. Next, we will have Ambassador Einar Jensen of the Embassy of Denmark in Korea delivering a welcoming remark on behalf of the European Union. Please welcome Mr. Einar Jensen. Director General Kuhl, uh, panelists from Korea and Europe and part dear participants, please let me extend my sincere greetings and welcome to you on this year's edition of the ROK and EU uh, Roundtable on Middle Eastern and North African Affairs, titled Changing Politics, Political Dynamics in the Middle East. I wish to thank all of you for attending, both of you who, who could make it to the Jeju Forum in person, there's quite a few of us, and those who are tuning in via online connections. I'm glad to say a few words on behalf of the European Union, because my colleague, the EU ambassador to Korea, Ms. Castillo Fernandez, was unable to participate in person. For those who attended previous editions of the EU ROK uh, uh, International Conference on the MENA region, you will notice that due to the COVID-19 uh, this year, we made a small alteration to the format. The event now takes place in the form of this roundtable. As part of the Jeju Forum in a hybrid format, we are pleased to be a part of the Jeju Forum this year, which allows for maximum visibility for this very important topic. Next year, we do hope to welcome all of you back in the previous format, EI, the fully fledged standalone EU uh, ROK MENA conference, uh, hopefully. As we are currently in Jeju, the Middle East may seem somewhat remote for some members of this audience, however not for all, and however, I am convinced that the MENA region is closely connected with the economic and political interest of both South Korea and EU. Countries in the Middle East are important trade and investment partners for us. We have intense people-to-people -people links and both the EU and the ROK have a strong interest in regional peace and stability, as well as upholding the international non-proliferation regime. The theme of the 16th Jeju Forum, Sustainable Peace, Inclusive Prosperity, applies perfectly to today's discussion, as I hope to our excellent panelists will share ideas on building peace and prosperity in the Middle East and how the EU and Korea can cooperate in this goal. Today's session will cover regional dynamics and will concentrate on, in particular on a key part of the MENA, MENA region, namely Iran and the Gulf. The region is in flux and the number of key developments recently took place. First, there are changes in the US policy towards the Middle East, including on US-Iran relations but also with regard to GCC countries and the peace in Yemen. Second, new initiatives aiming at a security architecture in the Gulf have emerged, and I would, like, I would be interested to hear participants' takes on this. Third, of course, critical negotiations have been ongoing in Vienna on renewing the JCPOA, with the EU playing an important role as a diplomatic facilitator. Fourth, and closely connected presidential elections were held in, in Iran last Friday, and the impact of this will have to be carefully considered as well. Before proceeding to our panel, let me say a few brief words on the EU policy towards the region. The EU now, the EU's new joint communication adopted back in February 2021 on a renewed partnership with the Southern Neighborhood confirms our intention to further step up engagement with the MENA region. 
It includes a dedicated economic and investment plan to spur the long-term socioeconomic recovery under the EU new neighborhood. Development and International Cooperation Invest Instrument, NDICI. Our renewed approach for the region further focus on five policy areas. The first one being human development, good governance and the rule of law. The second one, resilience, prosperity and digital transition. The third one is peace and security. And fourth one, migration and mobility. And last but not least, the green transition and the climate resilience that is so important. The EU and its member states will also continue our efforts to prevent and solve conflicts and to strengthen political dialogue in the region. For instance, <coughs> through our <coughs> lending role in the JCPOA negotiations. Through the, international, uh, through the International Brussels Conference on Syria, raising funds for the future of the country and the region, and through EU support for a sustainable solution to the conflict in Yemen. Just to name a few examples. We have a wealth of great panelists, so I will leave it up to them to elaborate and to have a more in-depth discussion. I look forward to hearing their thoughts and also to hearing from the online audience who will have the opportunity to post questions and comments to the moderator. Thank you again for taking the time to participate in our discussion on this important region. I, and I hope you will enjoy what promises to be a very enriching conversation today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your warm remarks. Now, let me gladly introduce the moderator for today's session. Professor Annam Sik from Director General at Korea National Diplomatic Academy. He was deeply involved in Israeli academia and now let us welcome moderator In Nam Sheikh with a big round of applause. Um, thank you for coming, good excellencies and ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to be a moderator this important session today. Um, actually, I have prepared some remarks before uh, jumping into the main discussions. But um, as we all know, due to the time constraints, because we are slightly behind the schedule at the moment, so just I would like to start our sessions. Um, but before uh, joining the sessions, I would like to uh, highlight nowadays, particularly um, over the last few weeks, there are lots of things happening uh, in the Middle East. Leadership changes in Iran and Israel, and still Biden administration of the United States is trying to make an every effort to get back to the JCPOA, but still some pause um, period. So always something has been happening in the Middle East. So in this sense, um, I just want all the panelists to put all the agendas or their expertise on the table, then we can have some big pictures or sketches on what's going on there. So before jumping into the, our main discussions, I would like to double check my European colleagues on the line. Do you, do you have me online? Are they still there? Okay. No problem, okay. Then I'd like to uh, invite our first speaker. Okay, I can see their face. Do you hear me? Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you, I'm expecting a great presentation from you, uh, the other part of the world. Our first speaker is Professor Park Kyun Do. Um, he's a professor of Sorang University. Um, after getting a bachelor degree at Sorang University, he studied abroad um, in Canada, McGill University for the master degree. And after that, he moved to Tehran in Iran, and he got a doctoral degree of Islamic studies. Um, there's no doubt that uh, Professor Park Kyondo is number one Iran expert in Korea, so I'm expecting a great presentation from him. Each panelist, due to the time constraints, will only have less than seven minutes. Um, I'd rather be... Uh, harsh moderator, then uh, moderate, moderator, please keep it in your mind. Floor is yours, Mr. Park. 
Thank you very much. To, oh, I'd like to first of all to express my deepest gratitude to uh, the judge forum, uh, the secretariat, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for inviting me as a, a guest speaker for today. Uh, the topic, uh, the, my presentation uh, title is Iran at its crossroads. As you know, the recently, the most recently, the, the Iranian the presidential election took place, and well, a, as everybody the expected, the the, uh, the Raisi, the head of the judiciary, uh, became a president. Uh, <clears throat> so I like to the today's in my small presentation. I like to uh, concentrate on what happened to the Iranian election and what would be the uh, impacts uh, of the election um, for uh, the many years to come, especially on Middle East issues. First of all, the legacy of uh, Trump. Uh, the, the picture shows, the title shows the, the end of nightmare. When he, his presidency was actually the nightmare for Iranians and for any other country, many people in the, in the world, but specifically in Iran, he is a nightmare itself. But after, the, the, after he retreated, I mean, the, the Iranians woke up, uh, woke up from nightmare to find, the, first of all, the strangled economy, and the, more than anything else, I think it's probably this is, this is the disaster, disastrous the impact of the, the legacy of Trump was to destruction, uh, was the destruction of the moderate and the reformist political agenda and their political basis. And the, it is well known, it is well expressed in the remarkable differences between the two legislative elections in 2016 and 2020. And hope for a change it turned radically into despair and depression and anger toward the moderates and reformists. And every, everything was blamed on the uh, Rouhani government. Uh, and this is the, the, uh, the contrast between 2016 and 2020. It was the 2016, the, on the left side picture, the, the lady actually the, uh, hosted a, a play, the, uh, play card, the 30 plus uh, 16, means that the, the reform-minded or young people try to elect all those 30, 30 candidates from Tehran for parliamentary election, and also those all 16 uh, candidates from uh, for the assembly of experts, and the result was 30 plus 15. The hope and the uh, excitement for a change was very very strong in 2016, and also on your right side, the presidential election 2013 and 2017, Rouhani actually, is, as a matter of fact, in 2013, he, uh, he promised the prudence and hope, and. He actually, the, and Iran engaged with the, uh, the, the Western powers on the nuclear uh, talks, and, and which eventually uh, became, became, uh, became fruitful in the form of JCPOA. But this election was entirely different from the 2013 and 2016. First of all, 2020, the last year, uh, so-called the principalists. Iran, actually, do, we have uh, basically two uh, political bases, like Usul Garayan, in the principalists. Normally, it's called the conservatives and hardliners in English um, newspaper. And another one is reformist, so-called the Eslaw uh, Talabat. But this time, 2020, uh, legislative election, and 2021, presidential election, all the, the winners actually the, uh, the principalists. Now the principalists have all the powers in Iran. Now they cannot blame anybody except themselves from now on. And the lower, lower voter turnout uh, shows the, the, the people's well, distrust or apathy or disgust uh, at what is going on in Iran. And also the, this, this victory is normally called the Khomeinism, which means that the the Velayat Fagi, the guardianship of the jurist is well maintained and, and expanding so-called its empire uh, in Iran. And also the, on the right side, in order to boost, in order to encourage people to vote, uh, even this, the image of the Soleimani uh, hand was actually used for the poster. And the, well, reformists were disarray, and moderates disarray, 
the, the February, the reformist newspaper, Arma Meli, uh, ran a picture uh, in which uh, Zarif and Hassan Khomeini hugged each other. And the newspaper actually show, tried to show the hope and actually the appeal to these people only when they united and the reformists can win the election, but it was a mere hope. And, and now the Raisi, uh, he's, probably, uh, he's probably the he likely, he's likely to expand his popularity by showing himself to be very, very bipartisan. But he was very smart in this, in this election. He does not want to become, he does not want to support uh, one, the, the, the Fugism principle, principalist the faction from which he came. He tried to be the principalist at the same time and reformist. And he actually the, he used reformist agenda uh, to uh, encourage people and to help people. And so he, he probably he will pay more attention to the economy uh, for the poor people while he is in president. And, but at the same time, it is probably harder for the West to maintain a channel of communication with his government than with the Rice's government because the, 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 probably the people in the important position uh, do not have any the, the, uh, the, the educational background in the United States as Barbara Salabang once projected. And also he has a problem uh, with the West on the humanized violation which took place in 1988. Um, and the, well, he was very uh, smart while because he tried to show that uh, he is very sympathetic with the poor. And he said that he, I have tasted the poverty and not merely heard about it. Whereas the reformist party or the current Rouhani government actually the entirely the strangled the innocence in the economy. Uh, and the prime example would be so-called Jah Jahangiri dollar because the, the, the foreign exchange uh, policy was entirely failed in the Iranian government. And this just shows, and also this shows the, the closeness, uh, closeness between the, uh, the supreme leader and the, the president elect. And the lastly, the, some remarks, and it probably will take a considerable time for moderates and reformists to, to reconciliate, reconciliate, uh, reconciliate their uh, political base. And nowadays on the SNS, in Iranian uh, SNS and newspaper, there are a lot of discussion, hotly, uh, hotly the contested discussions on why reformists lost the election and who killed the reformists or reformists killed themselves, you know, suicide. So there is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of discussion on it. And the, also there is a problem always, the reform, when, when you talk about the reformists, always the same old faces. Uh, who will replace Khatami as a new leader, young leader? and absolutely lack of young, younger generation, especially the leader who can appeal to the younger generation uh, is quite conspicuous. And there is, a, there is a conjecture that probably Hassan Khomeini will uh, lead the reformist, reformist faction and the, in, the, in, the, in the near future. And also the fundamental issue is still debated about who will, who will be the next supreme leader and the role of SEPA. And as far as I know, and also the, as, is, as is well, as is very evident from the, the, the uh, interview that the president-elect gave uh, days ago, uh, the, the Iran would maintain the supporting so-called proxies in the Middle East, and the Iran will not uh, bend uh, their knees before any power. So probably the, the, same, the same foreign policy would go on, maybe perhaps much more difficult. Uh, and also, the, uh, lastly, I like to make a, uh, I like to make a emphasis on this part. Um, many in the West is always try to, to boost the so-called so National Council of Resistance of Iran, is a branch of MEK, Mujahideen e Khalq, and they never, they would never ever a viable political alternative for Iran. So just forget about it. We, it, it is much better to forget about it, and they they have no chance to get any power in Iran, and probably 99% of the Iranians hate this organization. But they are very uh, popular on SNS, but uh, on SNS, and it, it should not, it should not lie in our eyes. Okay, I, I don't have any enough time, so I'd like to go on, but probably the professor, professor An Ian would not be very happy with it. <laughs> thank you very much, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bob, for your great presentation. Um, actually, we're going to save uh, the later part of this session uh, about the Q&A. Our next speaker, let me invite um, Mr. Gabriel Munuera Vignals. Um, do you help me? Yes, very well. Yeah, I will briefly introduce you. Um, he is the head of the Arabian Peninsula and Iraq Division in European External Action Services. He served before uh, being posted this position. He used to serve as deputy head of the EU delegation to Turkey and head of political affairs uh, in Cairo. And he published a number of articles and columns on the Middle East and Asia affairs. Um, Mr. Munuer Vignals, you have floor. So what time is it now over there? Uh, it is uh, 10.48. Good morning. Morning. Okay. <laughs> floor is yours. Good morning. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, and thank you very much to the organizers. Um, uh, the Gulf is uh, a region of, uh, of great importance for us. I mean, uh, needless to say, um, any uh, instability uh, crises uh, in this region have a direct impact uh, on Europe, uh, on our economy, uh, obviously impact on navigation, important um, uh, actors when it comes uh, to uh, energy, obviously, um, but uh, also um, our security. Um, <clears throat> These, uh, these countries, uh, particularly some of the uh, Gulf Cooperation uh, Council uh, members, uh, have been playing in recent years very important roles in um, the region, broadly speaking, not only, of course, the Gulf, but also what we call the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa, uh, and beyond, I mean, Sahel, Horn of Africa. Uh, they've been playing very significant roles uh, in particular in crises that have a, a direct uh, impact on the European Union, that are of direct and very important um, uh, concern uh, to us. Um, these countries, uh, a number of them, uh, have been undergoing very significant um, changes in, in recent uh, years. Um, obviously, uh, a modernization uh, drive um, uh, led by uh, some uh, younger leaders uh, in these countries. Uh, all these countries have visions, uh, vision 2030, vision 2035, uh, visions of um, socioeconomic modernization, uh, in particular um, uh, economic diversification away from uh, over-dependence uh, on hydrocarbons. Um, also um, important processes of um, societal opening. Um, these are all um, um, developments of, of, of interest to us, of course, um, and uh, developments where we see interest um, in, in supporting, in um, accompanying, in a spirit of partnership. This is a region where the European Union is significantly invested. Um, we uh, have strong relations with uh, uh, these countries. Um, we have been expanding our diplomatic presence in the Arabian Peninsula, for example. Ten years ago, um, we basically only have one delegation in Riyadh covering the entire Arabian Peninsula. Now we have delegations in Abu Dhabi, we have delegations in Kuwait, and um, hopefully, uh, inshallah, uh, next year we will open a, a delegation in, in Qatar as well. That is the intention. Um, we've been uh, enhancing our institutional engagement with these uh, countries, um, GCC countries, by regionally and of course, as the region uh, unfortunately experienced some difficulties uh, in the past a few years, um, we expanded also um, our bilateral uh, engagement through cooperation arrangements between the European External Action Service and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of some uh, GCC countries, also informal human rights uh, dialogues. Um, as the GCC is in a better position now after the Al-Ula summit, uh, overcoming some of the internal difficulties. Uh, we are uh, intending to resume our full institutional uh, engagement with the GCC. That goes back many years to the, to the 80s. Uh, we have a, a cooperation agreement with the GCC going back to the late uh, 80s. Um, so we are expanding, we are significant actor uh, in this region, we are expanding our interaction with this region. Um, I think that we share 
uh, some uh, a number of um, interests with these countries, in particular GC countries, um, on the global agenda. For example, uh, fighting the pandemic. Uh, some of these GCC countries uh, have been uh, contributing significantly, as we have, to international efforts to fight the pandemic. COVAX, uh, notably. Um, Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, co-hosted with uh, us, with the President of the European Commission in May last year, uh, a pledging event um, on uh, vaccines for the, for the pandemic. Also, um, the big, uh, our big priorities, um, um, green economy, digital economy, these are also the priorities uh, of some of these GCC countries. Uh, as I was saying before, I mean, obviously, uh, climate change, economic diversification. So these are important elements that we definitely want to work more together on. Um, combating uh, terrorism, um, uh, fighting uh, extremism, promoting tolerance, uh, interfaith dialogue, um, freedom of uh, religion and belief. These are big um, issues, big um, agenda items um, for our bilateral interaction, but also for the global agenda. And we're very much um, uh, working closely with these countries. I mean, we are um, uh, a number of our member states, the EU, some of these GCC countries are members of the anti-Daesh coalition, for example. Um, we uh, have, first and foremost, and we'll hear more uh, on, on this, um, an interest in promoting de-escalation, dialogue, and long-term regional solutions in the Gulf to address uh, existing tensions. Obviously, some of them long-standing. Um, uh, we saw in 2019 in particular, um, and early 2020, uh, an escalation of, of, of grave uh, potential consequences. And uh, we've been reaching out to the region, our high representative um, at, uh, at various levels, our member states as well, to promote de-escalation and dialogue. Um, and we've been hearing, of course, interest in, in a, a role for the European Union in these broader efforts. Um, of course, different views also on, on how to address uh, these issues. Um, and obviously, we've seen a number of initiatives, um, some from the region, some from other international uh, actors. Um, at present, of course, for us, um, JCPOA, and we will hear more from Karin uh, on, on this, uh, is the priority. But of course, we are mindful of um, the broader picture in the Gulf and Gulf security. And obviously, uh, once we uh, sort the uh, JCPOA, um, we will definitely try our utmost to contribute to these efforts that have to be uh, region-owned uh, and ideally region-led as well. But of course, we, with others, are very much interested in contributing to these efforts. Um, and of course, still in the Gulf region, um, there are two uh, particular situations that uh, are of, of particular interest and, and concern to us as well. Uh, one of them um, is and remains uh, efforts to um, uh, stabilize uh, Iraq, Iraq's efforts to um, uh, finally step out of obviously many years of, of difficulties, um, still facing uh, challenges, of course, uh, important challenges uh, across the, the board, economic, uh, public health, the pandemic, uh, security, indeed, Daesh, and the fight against Daesh is not uh, completely over. There's going to be a ministerial uh, of the anti-Daesh coalition in Rome uh, next week. Um, and obviously, we will reiterate, our 100% representative will be there, we will reiterate uh, our firm commitment um, to the work of the, of the coalition. Um, we will uh, have the intention of uh, observing, as requested by the Iraqis, uh, the early elections in October. Uh, we contribute uh, or try to contribute to uh, civilian security sector uh, reform. Um, so we are obviously um, definitely um, trying to significantly uh, support uh, Iraq's efforts also um, uh, towards a balanced foreign policy and some of the bridge building that we have seen um, Iraq authorities playing uh, recently. Um, and of course, uh, another very important um, situation in this uh, region, in the Arabian Peninsula Gulf, uh, is the conflict in Yemen, the world's worst humanitarian tragedy that we uh, definitely want, again, with others and supporting uh, UN-led peace efforts, uh, contribute to putting an end to. And this has a diplomatic and political dimension, uh, a security dimension. This has a humanitarian dimension. We continue pushing for um, access and for um, access to um, basic commodities, uh, humanitarian aid, and space for humanitarian uh, actors. And of course, we try to also think of the day after, uh, so uh, trying to, to think a little bit longer term. 
But of course, the big priority right now is a ceasefire, is uh, some confidence building measures, uh, port, airports uh, that permit regular flow of uh, basic commodities into the country. Um, and of course, uh, political talks, very, very important to chart out um, uh, um, uh, a path out of the, the current uh, crisis. So this is of, of great concern to us. It is of great concern to a number of GCC countries as well, uh, of course, and, uh, and we are liaising closely with them, with others, as I said, in support of uh, UN-led uh, efforts. Also working very closely uh, with uh, UNAMI, with the UN mission in, in Iraq, um, also in preparation for the, the coming elections. So this is a little bit of a, of a very broad picture, if you will, but um, um, I'm obviously happy to, to address questions. And of course, there will be a lot more to be said about this. And of course, now uh, Karin and, and Jos will complement, uh, particularly Karin as regards um, Iran, JCPOA, and so on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Manuel Vinales, uh, for giving us big picture. You slightly touched upon the multilateral cooperation between GCC and European Union. And at the same time, you are touching upon the Iraq issues and Yemen conflict. It's, it's amazing. So, but we do have time constraints, so we can postpone our Q&A sessions later part of the, this meeting. Our next speaker would be Professor Kimundi. She's supposed to speak about U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. United States is not belonging to the region, but one of the most influential factors to determine the future of the whole region. So we have to focus on how Biden administration is going to or where to go. So that's why we invite Professor Kim eun -bi to this session. She is Associate Professor, Korea National Defense University. She is, she is in uniform. She is acting um, active Army major, graduate from the military academy for a long time ago, <laughs> but got PhD in the Arizona State University. Um, her dissertation about, is about the transitional justice and democratization after Arab Spring and the region. Very fascinating topic. But today, she is going to focus on the U.S. policy toward the Middle East. Professor Kim, floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Yin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I think I need to go fast. <laughs> so today I'd like to talk about U.S. Middle East, Middle East policy. The Biden administration's foreign policy has not been officially announced yet, but it can be found in several documents. Uh, documents. According to the White House uh, interim security, security strategy, the keywords of the Biden administration's strategy can be explained by U.S. is back, diplomacy is back, alliances are back. The White House di diagnosed that rising nationalism, receding democracy, growing rivalry with China, Russia, and other authoritarian states, and a technological uh, revolution are reshaping every aspect of our lives. Thus, the U.S. needs to lift up the values that the U.S. pursued. Related to that, the other pillar of the U.S. foreign policy seems to be the competition between China and U.S. The annual threat assessment said China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and other transnational organizations are the threat to the U.S. and emphasized that uh, China's pursuit of a great power is the biggest threat to U.S. To narrow this understanding down to the Middle East policy, we can find that the U.S. will uh, focus on multilateralism, the values, and the U.S.-China competition. Therefore, the United States tries to fasten the ties uh, with Israel and Saudi Arabia and utilize every uh, accord. Under the multilateralism, U.S. can focus on the competition between China. In this regard, as one of the efforts, U.S. military is preparing to modify the central, uh, U.S. Central Command's area of responsibility to include Israel, while Israel used to be under the European Command. By the way, uh, with this modification, will, uh, this modification will allow Israel and other troops in the Middle East uh, to effectively communicate or exchange it, their information or command and control. So, and also, U.S. is trying to improve the relationship with Saudi Arabia by supporting the war in Yemen, 
while Biden uh, had mentioned a human rights issue in Saudi Arabia where a journalist was killed. Uh, reviving the JCPOA is in this line as well. By strengthening the ties among the countries that are friendly with the, the, the US, US wants them to deal with the Iranian problem so that the US can focus on the competition in the Indo-Pacific uh, area rather than the uh, Middle East issues. However, the problem is that the key players in the Middle East for US foreign foreign policy implications are not supported. Israel and Saudi Arabia oppose reviving the, the, the JCPOA. Even Israel's uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, Bennett also mentioned that Israel opposed renegotiating, renegotiation, even though its position hurts or ruins the relationship between the US and Israel. Furthermore, China is actively approaching not only Iran, but also Israel and Saudi Arabia. China even invested a, invested a seaport in Haifa, which raises concern of the US. Under this situation, I am not optimistic about the future of JCPOA, by the way. Basically, I think it is hard to be signed, but if it is signed, I think it will be hard to be stable or sustainable because Israel and Saudi Arabia are not supportive, and the hardliners government is to come to Iran. Although there are many analysts that uh, see the optimistic future of the new Iranian government, but I think that in order for secure, securing its regime, the Iranian, new Iranian government needs to differentiate its policies comparing to that of former government. And IRGC is uh, so much influential in Iranian politics, I think that they would not be happy with negotiation with the US. Uh, another challenge is the US politics. The United States Parliament is now polarized and Republicans have little uh, motivation or incentives on reviving JCPOA or uh, cooperating with Democrats on whatever issue it is. Even though the new JCPOA is assigned, I believe it would, not, it would be difficult to be ratified. And I wonder what China would obtain when the JCPOA is revived. I think it would be beneficial for China since, um, since it can explicitly approach Middle East countries, but this situation is not happy for the US as well. With uh, Israel opposed to the revival of the JCPOA, it is questionable whether the Abraham Accords would sustain once JCPOA is signed. And also, as witnessed in the responses of the Sunni countries during the last Israel and Palestine conflict, uh, Palestine cause has not completely disappeared. Even though it, it seems like each country's national interests uh, are valued over uh, political causes in the international society. Above all, uh, China is actively approaching the countries in the Middle East. Competition with China at the economic, military, and political level in the Middle, Middle East will pose a major challenge to the Biden administration foreign policy toward the Middle East. This is all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Um, our next speaker, let me invite Mrs. Karin Gott Rutter. Um, she has over 20 years of EU civil service and diplomatic experiences in the field of foreign relations in general. Now she is a senior member of the Iran Task Force under the direct supervision of the Deputy Secretary General of the European External Action Services. Um, so we are expecting the European Union's role in between Iran and the United States to propel the resuming JCPOA at the present time. Um, let me invite Karin Guterata. Please, it's your turn. Thank you very much. And good morning and good afternoon. 
Um, I'm very pleased and honored to be part of such a uh, distinguished panel, is, uh, panel with colleagues and friends. Uh, indeed, it's very interesting times for us dealing with uh, Iran. Um, as was mentioned earlier, of course, um, the Iranian elections of last week, but also what is going on in Vienna these days. As you know, the talks have been happening uh, very intense over um, already since April, beginning of April, and with the so sole purpose of reviving the JCPOA. POA. Um, but let me bring a little bit of background first also on how the EU works with Iran and how we see um, our relationship with, with Iran. Um, basically, I would say that our relationship stands on three legs, if I can say that. And the first one and the most important foundation is the JCPOA. Um, JCPOA has global importance as a non-proliferation agreement. This is uh, something we need to remember. It's not supposed to address everything, but it really has a nuclear angle and non-proliferation uh, proliferation, uh, angle. And it also is endorsed through the UN Security Council Resolution 2231, and therefore has an international legitimacy that goes beyond the, uh, the participation or the participants. Um, and for us, of course, as been mentioned already, as the EU, the JCPOA uh, gives us a very defined role as the coordinator of the Joint Commission, which one can say is the governing structure of this deal. Um, and since early April, we have been facilitating these talks in Vienna. Uh, Vienna is, of course, the location where the uh, 2015 deal was finalized. It's also the location where we have the International um, uh, Atomic Ag Energy Agency. So it's a it's a good a good location, let's say. And in Vienna, the EU has been acting as a conduit um, between uh, the uh, the participants and the US delegation. As you know, the US delegation is physically present, but is actually not in the meetings themselves. So here we're talking about a, a, a concrete example of uh, uh, shuttle diplomacy, I would say, and that is indeed um, conducted by, by us. Um, and uh, the second leg is um, is based on the first one, so to speak, which is, I said, the foundation. So thanks to the JCPOA, we have managed to broaden our cooperation with Iran. Um, and uh, let me take you back a couple of years. So we had the signature, the agreement back in 2015. Uh, in 2016, uh, the high representative and vice president, who was then Federica Mogherini, um, she saw an opportunity to engage with Iran much more broadly, and she, together with a number of, uh, I think we're talking nine uh, EU commissioners responsible for everything between agriculture, uh, trade, energy, um, a number of sectoral responsibilities that are important, they visited Iran and uh, tried to uh, engage in a dialogue which would broaden our bilateral relationship with, with Iran. Um, Gabriel, my colleague earlier mentioned other types of agreements that the EU has with GCC states. Uh, when it comes to Iran, uh, the EU does not have an illegal uh, arrangement. It is really the JCPOA um, that is important. Um, and the discussions in Tehran were fruitful. Uh, there was a declaration that was signed between uh, Mrs. Mogherini and the foreign minister Zarif. Um, and the idea was to deepen and broaden our dialogue with Iran and, and, and our cooperation. And we have man managed to do so. So alongside this, I would call the political go ahead, we have also earmarked some, uh, uh, some funding that could stimulate this cooperation. Um, and as um, the Danish ambassador already alluded to before, uh, new programs, new instruments are uh, within the EU budget now being uh, decided and we are uh, looking at um, engaging also with Iran with, within this uh, framework um, for the next seven years. Um, and uh, um, 
I would also like to mention it comes a little bit apart, but Iran has also been benefiting quite a lot from EU support from our humanitarian uh, budget. I, I remember this was also mentioned earlier by my colleague uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Korea. Um, uh, and uh, this is important. Iran is a country that often has suffered from floods 2019, uh, earthquake prone, a seismic area. Uh, again, uh, support has been provided and not to, to um, forget the, the COVID-19 situation that has been affecting the country uh, a lot, as well as the Iranian generous support to the Afghan refugees. So here we have two legs. And then the last leg that I would say uh, is important, the third leg is our dialogue that we have with uh, Iran on, on regional matters, which where we are focusing specifically on conflicts and crisis in the Middle East. Um, we see these as mutually reinforcing, um, um, but the most important one is indeed the JCPOA. Um, so that is why we are now focusing on the revival of the JCPOA, meaning a return by Iran to compliance of the commitments that they took under the uh, 2015 deal and for the US to lift their sanctions that they imposed when uh, the Trump administration left the deal in 2018. As a side remark, because it might be a question, as for the EU, the sanctions related to the uh, JCPOA were lifted and have remained lifted throughout this period. But there are other sanctions in place that are not related to JCPOA. So why has the EU been so adamant about the preservation of the JCPOA? Well, first and foremost, this is a matter of global security. It is a non-proliferation agreement I mentioned before. And we strong, strongly believe that there is no desire for the world to have another nuclear state. And the best way so far has been to uh, ensure um, the best way to ensure that the Iranian nuclear program remains uh, peaceful has been the JCPOA. And secondly, it is a multilateral um, agreement. Uh, it's a fruit of multilateral diplomacy, which is the which is the very basis for the creation of the EU and how we continue to work with our partners internationally. And I like to remember. Uh, so that the International Atomic Energy Agency is another international body which has a is the only mandated uh, entity in um, uh, I can hear myself in I can, um, to verify and monitor in Iran's nuclear pro pro this provides legitimacy and trust and even working with partners, we like to listen to partners, which we hope will continue to um, and contribute to building trust. Um, I understand I need to wrap up, but I'd like to get my last point in, uh, which is um, this policy is what we call a balanced, comprehensive approach, which includes dialogue and which has an aim to address all issues of concern critical when there are divergences, but also cooperative when there is mutual trust. And this remains our approach. I would have liked to uh, say a few things on the actual situation today, but I've, I, I will stop here for now and will uh, maybe this will come up in the, in the mm -hmm. Q&A later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your insightful uh, presentation. But due to some technological difficulties, there was some kind of bad connections, but we can fully understand what you meant. Um, let me invite our next speaker, uh, Mr. Just Hilterman. Um, he's going to touch upon the very fascinating title, From Diatribal to the Dialogue, How Resolute is the Middle East State's Sudden Resort to Diplomacy? Um, Just Hilterman is now Program Director of the International Crisis Group. Uh, before. Uh, taking this position, he used to serve as an executive director of Human Rights Watch's Arms Division and the research coordinator at the Palestinian human rights organization Al Haq. Um, Mr. Hilterman, are you uh, in Brussels as well? I certainly am, yes. Yes, okay. Floor is yours. You can have only six minutes, I'm afraid. 
<laughs> okay, um, and I'll reset my clock here. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor, and thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me here. I'm very pleased to be here, and I know it's already your dinner time. Um, so, indeed, the title of my presentation is "From Diatribes to Dialogue: How Resolute Is uh, Middle East st States' Southern Resort to Diplomacy?" We've seen a flurry of. Uh, countries, governments uh, talking to each other suddenly uh, in the last few months. Uh, governments that at, had been at odds uh, for quite some time. Um, and so we're curious to see if this is uh, something, uh, a real turnabout around, or is it um, just a temporary thing? Uh, we saw, for example, the United Arab Emirates reaching out to Iran already starting in 2019 and 2020. We saw uh, Israel normalizing relations with a number of countries in the Middle East and North Africa, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Sudan, uh, Morocco. Uh, we, th uh, this was, uh, of course, uh, uh, almost a year ago. Then we saw in January of this year, the Al-Ula uh, summit already referred to in this event, um, and a rapprochement uh, between Qatar on the one hand and Saudi Arabia and the Emirates uh, on the other. We saw uh, Turkey and Egypt uh, speaking to each other, and that had been a while. And finally, and not least, uh, we saw the uh, uh, heads of the security uh, in, um, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia and, and Iran also meeting in Baghdad to discuss uh, mutual relations, a very important development, at least symbolically, if not yet in substance. But how serious are these events? How serious should we take them? Um, and I would argue that much of it is related to United States policy, not necessarily only to the uh, election of a new president, um, because uh, first of all, I would say that um, the United Emir uh, Arab Emirates already realized in 2019 and 2020 that the Trump administration, or that the United States more generally, was unreliable as a, as a protector and a guarantor of peace and stability in the Gulf on the side of the Gulf Arab states. Uh, President Trump, they saw as also as unpredictable. He would say one thing, but he would not necessarily act on it. Um, and because of uh, that perception, so under the Trump administration, the, the Emirates reached out to Iran uh, during the uh, pandemic, uh, providing humanitarian aid, also um, sent an, an intelligence delegation to Tehran to discuss maritime issues. Um, and, and this is also the time when the em Emirates decided to make public their already very solid relationship with Israel and to normalize it through the Abraham Accords. Um, so this was clearly a response uh, or reflecting uh, their concern about the United States. The second uh, issue is the Biden election. Um, this um, uh, made clear that the United States was ready to go back to speaking to Iran about the JCPOA. We have already heard about this. Um, and this meant that Saudi Arabia and the Emirates uh, realized they had to put their own, their own house in order or they would be caught out. And so this is why you see the Al-Ula agreements. They realized they had to uh, make peace within the GCC um, and, and to you know, come to terms with Qatar in order to be a stronger, uh, in a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Um, and of course, uh, we all, and this is also when the, uh, um, Saudi Arabia began talking to Iran. Uh, so all of this uh, is, is related in some way to US policy. The question is now, how sustainable is this? Um, uh, we can ask, um, uh, you know, one important factor is, will the JCPOA be restored? If it isn't, then I think um, this diplomacy will fall apart um, and tensions will rise again. Um, so, so the revival of the JCPOA is not only important for non-proliferation reasons, and that is, of course, it's extremely important for that, but it's also for um, the stability in the region in the future. And I'm not guaranteeing that if the JCPOA is revived, that there will be stability in the region, but at least there's an opportunity then to start discussions that might work toward that. So that's one. The second thing, uh, second question we can ask is, is will Iran be contained in the region? Uh, because if Iran continues to spread its influence, then of course there's going to be pushback, first of all, from Israel, but also from the Emirates and Saudi Arabia and other states in the region uh, who are frightened of uh, what they see as Iranian hegemony. 
A uh, third question we can ask is, will Qatar play the game? Um, they've come together again with uh, Saudi Arabia, a bit less so with the Emirates, I would say, or, or not quite yet with the Emirates, and maybe never will. But what will this lead to? Will it lead to further tensions or will they manage this difficult relationship? And remember that the breach that happened in 2017 wasn't the first time um, that uh, problems arose between these uh, partners within the GCC. Another important question, will the Democrats in the United States win in 2024? Or will there be another return of a Trump-like administration? Or uh, Because we know that Trump now controls the Republican Party. So if the Republicans win, um, there will be, again, a seesaw in foreign policy, including in the Middle East. Um, and so uh, the current situation will not uh, continue. And final question, uh, will there be any incidents in the region that could upset everything? Um, there could be a, a Houthi missile that hits Riyadh, for example, um, or the Israelis may, um, um, uh, sorry, the Israelis may um, uh, decide to carry out another attack inside Iran against a nuclear facility or a nuclear scientist and the Iranians will respond. So there could be uh, any kind of uh, flashpoint uh, exploding in the region that would upset this. So my final word is this. In order to ensure that we can move from the current stage uh, and use the and build on the diplomacy that is there between these actors in the region, we need to uh, help these actors sustain a dialogue and to structure it. Uh, and um, and this is where the European Union can play a very important role. Of course, the United States government would have to back it up. The United Nations, the EU, have important roles to play, but also states like uh, South South Korea. And, uh, and others in, in, the, in the world uh, could uh, support this effort uh, to ensure that there is no inadvertent outbreak of violence in the Gulf region and that we can over time work to stabilize the region and maybe in the future come to some kind of new security architecture that would uh, guarantee peace and stability for all the major players in that region. Sorry, I went a little bit over the six minutes, but thank you very much for listening to me. That's okay. Thank you for, thank you for your compelling statement. Um, to be honest with you, particularly um, having heard that maybe next presidential election in the United States, another Trump will be coming, then it sounds like very pessimistic about the future of the international politics. Anyway, our last speaker, but not the least, uh, is Ms. Kim Da Eun, who is working at the Foreign Ministry of Korean Government. Now, she is Second Secretary of the um, Israel Palestine Desk Officer at the Middle East Division 1. She's going to touch upon Korea's perspective uh, on ROK MENA relations. So, you can hear from her about the Korean perspective on the Middle East and what's going on there. Da Eun, floor is yours. Thank you, Professor In. Uh, as today's last speaker, I'm going to talk very briefly about Korea MENA relations and the significance of some recent developments in the reason for these relations. Traditionally, economic cooperation, especially in energy and infrastructure, has been at the core of the ROK MENA relations. But since the 1990s, when Korea became for the first time a non permanent member of the United UN um, Security Council, it started uh, its financial contributions for enhancing peace and development in MENA. And Korea also dispatched troops to Iraq for peace settlement and re reconstruction in 2004. And ever since, it has continued to strengthen its participation in peacekeeping operations in the region. Dongmyeong unit in the UNIFIL in Lebanon is a good example. Korea also provided humanitarian assistance to Yemen, Libya, Palestine, and refugees in Syria and its neighboring countries. Most recently, the ROK MENA relations have diversified the areas of cooperation, notably in public health and cultural exchanges. Uh, in terms of cultural exchanges, uh, in 1929, uh, just two years ago, the K-pop sensation BDS, they performed at the King Fahad International Stadium in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, which was the first performance by a non-Arab artist. 
in that stadium. And Middle East culture and language are also gaining popularity within Korea. In 2005, only around 500 Korean students in high school chose Arabic as their second foreign language. But in uh, 2017, the number jumped to 50,000, 10 times. So such growth of exchanges between the two regions are further solidifying the arab kmena relations. And then what do some recent changes in the political dynamics in the MENA mean in terms of the arab kmena relations? In fact, the rapidly changing political climate in the region makes it very difficult to forecast the future, but we should do our best to seek opportunities for peace and prosperity in the midst of many uncertainties. When Israel and a number of Arab countries announced their normalization agreements last year, the Korean government welcomed those agreements and expressed its hope that they will serve as opportunities to establish stability and peace in the region. Uh, if the agreements do effectively serve their reconciliatory functions and bring greater regional stabilization, Korea too will be able to expand its exchanges with the related countries greatly. However, what happened just last month showed that the finding a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is crucial for bringing about permanent peace in the Middle East. Korea supports a two-state solution based on dialogue between the parties. During the recent clash, the Korean government expressed its concern over the situation of violence and high civilian casualties and called on the parties to cooperate with the international community to establish lasting peace. It also acknowledged the uh, mediating efforts made by the US and Egypt, and it pledged an emergency humanitarian assistance for the people in Palestine. And regarding the negotiation for restoring the JCPOA, the Korean government supports the ongoing efforts to restore the agreement. And this is in line with Korea's support in general for the peaceful resolution of nuclear issues. And because we have a um, North Korean nuclear issue as well, I think the a successful resolution of the Iranian nuclear issue will have implications to Pyongyang as well. To sum up, Korea's relations with MENA are expanding and diversifying. Contribution to peace and security has become an increasingly important foreign policy goal. But I'd like to stress also that for Korea to expand its role in the Middle East, it also needs to gain greater support from the Korean public on its MENA policy. And for that, uh, outreaching and awareness raising activities are important. So events like today's roundtable has its meaning. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll conclude my presentation here, and I, I thank all the other panels for their insightful presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tang. Thank you, Dawn, for saving your time and good presentation as well. I'm afraid time is up. Actually, we are supposed to end this session, half part six, and my next session is much more important because it's dinner time. But if you may, we're going to spend 10 more minutes if it is okay. So I will uh, give the opportunity to ask a question to the panelists in this room. I found uh, there are some ambassadors, excellencies here in this room from the United Arab Emirates and Egypt and Denmark, as we see. And former ambassador to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Korean ambassador, Ambassador Kim is there. So if you have any questions or make a comment, then please feel free to ask. No? Ambassador? Yes, thank you for a wonderful presentations. I just have a quick question for Ms. Kim. You were a little bit uh, not very optimistic about the uh, Iranian deal coming through. I wonder uh, if you can tell us more why, and if, that, if that's the case, if it doesn't come through, what do you think will happen? Because it seems it's going to be, uh, it's, it's part of the, uh, uh, the region. So many new arrangements are around that deal going to happen. So if it falls through, then I suspect it will be a little bit of a chaotic situation. So I'd like your feedback on that. Thank you. I will give you some more minutes. Um, and let me collect some more questions. And OK, Ambassador. 
Just uh, another comment as His Excellency uh, uh, Ambassador of Egypt uh, to uh, Ms. Kim. <laughs> Uh, because to be honest, uh, uh, maybe uh, you're right if, if it's a history repeat itself. To be honest, we see the history with Iran when they signed the GCPOE, they, they became more aggressive. And really when they get uh, the money or we can say the cash, it's being utilized in the wrong direction, which is really support the proxy like in Yemen, other country to, to use their proxy war. Uh, we hope this time the GCPOE is really they consider really the aggression of Iran, I mean, especially the ballistic missile, really to be controlled and really uh, put uh, clearly to Iran to not uh, really use uh, whatever this, uh, what we can say, the agreement to go back and uh, we can say history repeat uh, itself. So this is just a concern. And Iran is a neighboring country. We hope uh, the relation goes back to normal with their neighbors and uh, really act as a really a normal country and stop uh, uh, really uh, supporting the, the terrorists around the world, whether in, in Yemen or in uh, Lebanon or anywhere, because the stability of the Middle East depends on Iran, to be honest. This is my comment uh, to, to, to what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, in this context, uh, let me ask a question to short question to the Mrs. Gott Grutter uh, on that kind of the resuming negotiation between P4 plus one versus Iran to deal with the uh, Iranian provocations in the region to use the proxies or something like that. So is it real hurdle to resume the talks? So can you, can you make a comment on that? Can you respond? Yes, thank you very, very much for this question. Um, if, if I understand you correctly, it's not about the JC, JCPOA, but uh, broader issues in the region, correct? It is, correct? it is, it is. Correct, correct. So uh, where I was uh, referring to earlier is that our approach is based on three legs, I call mm -hmm. it. Um, the last one is indeed the, um, the, the leg that deals with regional issues. Um, what is important to remember is that in the JCPOA talks today in Vienna, we do not address the other issues. It is clearly only focusing on sanctions issues mm -hmm. and nuclear issues, which are the part and parcel of the deal. The other issues are something that one uh, we, we are uh, addressing in a diplomatic approach. We do not have an agreement uh, and, and so on. What uh, we have had back in 2018, 19 and 20 were a dialogue uh, with Iran together with a couple of other European countries where we addressed regional issues. And in that context, also these matters did come up. Um, and we hope that we will continue with this diplomatic approach also uh, when it comes to the new government that will be sworn in, um, the president will be sworn in early, early August. So again, I repeat what our sort of mantra is from the European Union is to work on a diplomatic uh, way. And um, I mean, we have heard the maximum pressure policy, uh, we can talk about maximum diplomacy uh, policy and, and uh, even with some of the most uh, difficult partners uh, in the world where we have disagreements, um, we do not see eye to eye, we, we maintain a dialogue and that is the important part. And we would like to do that with international partners such as, as the Republic of Korea as well. Thank you, uh, thank you, I got your point. Thank you very much. Um, for the comment and ask, so, Professor Kim, you yeah. can respond in, yeah. in a minute. Oh, yeah, okay. then, <laughs> sure, because um, I need to leave. Okay. <laughs> she has to catch the flight now. <laughs> okay, so I'm relating the Iranian nuclear issue as a regime, regime security. So for the Iranian, Iranian uh, regime, I mean the supreme leader or the, uh, the hardliners in that regime. So having the nuclear is their vital issue. So. The, Basically, I think they cannot give up their nuclear, like North Korea. See, Kim Jong-un cannot um, give up their nuclear 
because it is really highly related to their survival. So when you come to the JCPOA, I, I said I'm not optimistic on the revival of the JCPOA. That's why uh, the Iranian government, I mean the Iranian supreme leader or the newly elected president would not be happy with uh, controlled nuclear because it's related to their written survival. So I also, the IRGC is very uh, influencing in their politics and they are militarized. That is a really important issue in Iran, I think, because uh, IRGC controlled Iran is very much um, concerning about their regime security and IRGC security itself. So they are militarizing all of the issues, including JCPOA as well. That's why I think it's um, not that optimistic. Thank you. Would it be enough? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. Um, I'm afraid we don't have much time to continue to uh, this session. So I'll give each panelist just for less than one minute. If you have missed something to make a point, then you can use this final word. I'll start from the Professor Park. Thank you. Probably the, the newly President elect Raisi would not have any voice in the decision of the Iranian decision on the JCPOA. The JCPOA will be decided by the committee members formed in the National Security Council, highest National Security Council, and then probably the last decision will be made by the Supreme Leader. Probably the Supreme Leader is very happy right now because the, the, the Raisi would be the first president in 18, 16 years that, that who, can, who can listen very carefully to the Supreme Leader. Uh, that is probably the, uh, the consolidation of the Usul Garayan, the principalist power in Iran, uh, will make it very hard for reformists or moderates, moderates actually to reconsolidate their political base for a con considerable time and it will be uh, the, it will be very difficult for the West especially to maintain uh, a very meaningful uh, the and meaningful and active the communication uh, it had with the Rouhani government. Thank you. Mr. Munera Vinals, do you have any comments? Um, thanks a lot. Uh, I think that uh, much, uh, much has been said and uh, obviously um, following up a little bit on what uh, George in particular said of the, the new uh, dynamics, the more conducive uh, environment. Um, this is something that the European Union uh, will, uh, with others, uh, and of course, uh, with the region, uh, try to contribute to, definitely. Thank you. Great. Um, Mrs. Godrota, do you have any final words? Can you hear me? So, sorry, yes, I had a technical glitch. Yeah. Um, just one little point maybe, uh, because we are one week after the elections um, and we have listened quite carefully to the speeches of the president-elect uh, Ibrahim Raisi and we have also talked to some of the Iranian diplomats and what we can understand at this point in time is that when it comes to Iran's foreign policy, uh, we will continue to see uh, importance from their perspective on the neighborhood, mm -hmm. a continuation of the Vienna talks, uh, including with the same negotiating team, and also an, the importance of engaging constructively with, with uh, um, partners in the region, including Saudi Arabia. So I think we have to be optimistic that uh, we can continue dialogue and there will be ways also for the region to come to, to terms with some of the security issues. Um, and we, as the European Union, we will, of course, support those efforts. So uh, let's be optimistic. Great. Thank you. Mr. Hilterman. Yeah, thank you. I just, just a quick comment uh, about the comment from the uh, Egyptian ambassador. Um, so I don't think there is empirical evidence that Iran uh, increased its um, regional power projection after signing the JCPOA in 2015. But it did become more aggressive in 2018, 2019, especially uh, in response to the American uh, maximum pressure campaign. Mm. And I think what that shows is that 
uh, it is possible to talk with Iran as enemies can and should, um, and that progress can be made. The JCPOA was evidence of it, but also that the nuclear agreement, while extremely important, is not sufficient and that there must be some kind of follow up, follow on agreement or at least discussions towards an agreement on the regional situation. So I, I just need to make very clear that the current talks in Vienna today, I hope they will succeed, but they shouldn't uh, be limited to that. And we need to move uh, towards a, a broader dialogue on these other regional issues, including the missile program. Excellent. Thank you. Pawn? Not for myself, but I think we covered almost all issues going on in the Middle East. So I thank all the panels and the moderator for our informative and comprehensive discussion. Thank you. Um, we didn't deal with any specific issues in depth way. Rather, we enumerated all the issues which we are facing in the region at the moment, from Iraq, GCC, Yemen, Iran, or Israel-Palestine, slightly. Um, which means that maybe next year, um, all things getting better, then we're going to get together in person here in Jeju Island, beautiful island, the most beautiful island in the world, I do believe. So you can come to this place for the participant as, as a participant in Jeju Peace Forum next year, then we're going to have a day and a half or sessions or something like that. Um, I attended this forum for a long time, many, many times, but I was surprised this year because three consecutive sessions which has dealt with the Middle East uh, took place in, in these places. This is first. So which means that always we had focused on only Northeast Asia, the Korean Peninsula peace issues. But now we are facing and we are exposed to the uh, Middle East peace issues, peace negotiations, or current what's going on there. We are interested much more than before which is a good sign because peace is universal value and to be dealt with by the international community as a whole. Thank you very much indeed to take your time to participate in this great session today. Maybe next year or some uh, other occasion we can get together in person. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed. For that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor In, for moderating the session so smoothly. And thank you to all the discussants as well as all the participants on the floor for taking part in this session. So now this brings us to the end of the roundtable session. This concludes the, today's final session. Thank you.